And what we're going to be doing really is there's three sessions we have. So today is really going to be giving you the intuition, giving you the basics of a very simple graph neural network, the graph convolutional network. And then the next session that uh, which which Ryan's going to do uh, uh, will fill in the gaps in terms of like what are all the different options and how um, how exactly you know you you build and design these things. Um, and then the session after that uh, gets into some some more like if you're more hands on, it gets into um, uh, augmenting uh, the the graph neural network designs and even talks a little bit about some issues that you may get when you're training, trying to trying to fit these 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 models. In addition to that, there's a fourth component, which is that the Stanford course has some um, collab homework assignments. And once um, I'm thinking once uh, next session in two weeks, once Ryan has sort of filled in the details a little more in depth on on how people um, actually the different ways the neural networks are constructed, the different methods, the techniques, then uh, we can start talking about the, the homeworks, which include actually going in Python and, and building um, some graph neural networks. So for those of you who want to, you can also do that part. Um, for those of you who don't, I think what I'm, what I'm hoping we have time for is to just sort of review uh, the question, the solutions. Um, but for those of you who want to, you can actually You'll have two weeks to work on it uh, before. So that's kind of the roadmap of where we're going. OK, so um, in terms of, of where we're going today, we're going to start by saying, OK, we, we looked at these node embeddings. And the idea is you have a, a graph, you have nodes, you have edges. And we're going to use the structure of the graph in order to find which nodes are similar. And so then ultimately we picked a dimension D and we, we mapped these nodes into D dimensional vectors such that similar nodes in our latent embedding space uh, will be close together. So in order to do that, we had to define two functions. We had to define an encoder and a decoder. So the encoder, of course, is the tricky part. That's how we actually create the embeddings. Uh, but then in most cases, the decoder was something very straightforward. It's either a cosine similarity or you take the dot product or uh, in a few cases, it was like L2 um, Euclidean distance, L2 loss, um, L2 norm, sorry. Um, so, so then we get to algorithms like, like node to vec um, using that. And um, when we did that, the technique we used to create this embedding Basically, what we ended up doing is we ended up creating a shallow embedding. So we ran this process separately for every node, and it created a d-dimensional vector. But in, in that sense, there was nothing shared, even though the process was the same. So it created um, embeddings that could be used together. They, they, you know, they were correlated. They worked together. Uh, but there's nothing really shared between them. And so uh, ultimately what we, what we talked about is you can think of those embeddings just as a giant lookup table where it's like one column in a giant table. And so if you had a table, if you, have, if you have N nodes, then you have this N by D table and that's, and that's what the shallow encodings look like. Um, so there's some limitations of this shallow approach. So one thing is it's, it's very expensive in terms of parameters, okay? So you have D times the number of nodes um, as the number of parameters. The other problem is, is this idea of that it's transductive, not inductive, okay? So since you run this process separately on every node, if I give you sort of this brand new node, then you have to run this process on it. But the process when you ran it on, on all the other nodes assumed you had a complete graph. And so this new node is connected some of these, to some of these old nodes, and they weren't there when you ran the process. And so the idea is you really can kind of only do this process if you have a complete graph and you just, you know, you have everything. So uh, it's not really able to, to be inductive into new nodes or new graphs. And the other key thing is that it doesn't incorporate any node features. 
So let's say your graph represents a molecule. There's a lot of properties of the different atoms that are in that molecule. And this thing is just looking at the graph structure. And so it's saying, oh, well, this thing has two neighbors. But it's not saying anything about, well, what is it? Is it a carbon with double bonds with two neighbors? Is it an oxygen? Is it a nitrogen? You know, what the heck is this thing? So, uh, so those are some limitations, and we're going to break through those today. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use a deep encoder. So our encoder today, now we're going to talk about using neural networks. We're talking about using, to start with, basically just uh, dense neural networks, MLPs. So here's a picture. Uh, you don't have to understand everything because basically this stuff is going to be further defined today and a little bit in the next series. But you can imagine you have a complex graph. You take your nodes and all of your, your, your edges, your connectivity information. You're going to do some operations. We'll call these graph convolutions. Uh, just like in a traditional neural network, we'll probably pass it through an activation function. We may use other things like dropout and other things to regularize it. And then eventually uh, we'll get some output. And the output could be different things. It could be on a node level, we could do uh, subgraph level um, data, and we could even do whole graph um, classification. So um, once we have this concept of a graph neural network, the cool thing about it is we can now do pretty much um, all the different tasks that you want in, in graph machine learning. We can do node classification. We can do link prediction on pairs of, of nodes. We can do community detection. Um, and uh, we can even compare whole graphs or, or subgraphs. OK, so that's what we want to do. And so why can't we just use what we already have? Um, so here at the top, you see a CNN where it's got images that are based on a grid. It's got um, text or speech, which are uh, based on sequences instead of a grid. And fundamentally, uh, they're not going to work with graph data because we don't have that nice regular topological con uh, structure. So you could have some nodes with very few connections. You could have nodes with thousands of connections. There's no fixed ordering. There's no canonical ordering of the nodes. Um, and then we're even going to get into, we'll see that graph neural networks can solve the uh, can be used in dynamic situations where you actually um, can be adding nodes to your network and you don't have to recompute everything from scratch, which is what you would have to do with node to vec. All right, so that's just a little bit of background. And so what we're going to start now with is some basics in terms of uh, motivation for uh, how we're going to how we're going to go about solving this problem um, that we just stated. So let me just pause here and just see. Um, any questions before I really jump into the meat of the CNN stuff? Hey, uh, Ted, what's the implication of that uh, there is no node ordering? Yeah, so um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more. Basically, what it means is that um, um, if you have a solution, it would be very unsatisfactory if it gave you slightly different answers depending on the order that you entered things. Okay, so like if you if if you were getting health insurance and you have three kids, uh, and if the order in which you typed your kids into the system changed the cost of your premium for your health insurance, even if it was only by five dollars. You would just be like, what kind of crazy system is this? What does it matter what order I enter my kids in, right? So as a data scientist, I just would not have faith in a system if it was giving me different answers depending on how um, I ordered things. And so, um, so ultimately, we will, we will stick to numerical processes that will give us the exact same answer uh, regardless of if we call this node one and that node two, or if we call something else node one and something else node two. Um, and we are actually going to, uh, at one point I'm gonna wait, but we are gonna talk about how, the very end, we're actually gonna talk about how you can, com you can compare what we build today, this graph convolution network, um, to a CNN or a transformer.
Does that answer your question, Ravi? Yep, definitely. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. So what are we gonna do? We are going to look at the local neighborhoods around every single node. And we're gonna define um, a strategy for taking information from all of my neighbors. And basically that will define a computation um, around a, a particular node. And ultimately what we can do is we can uh, we can do this for all the nodes, and then we can repeat the process multiple times so that we're sort of stacking layers. And, and that will be, um, uh, that'll make more sense uh, as we, we get more into it. So basics, these are some of the, 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 the standard graph things. So assume that we have big V, a set of vertices. Um, big A is the adjacency matrix. So right now we're just gonna talk about undirected graphs and just assume it's like a binary, you know, matrix of ones and zeros. Um, and now we're gonna throw into play that we're gonna have this uh, matrix X um, where now we're using M instead of D, but if we have M uh, features for each node, then we're gonna have an M by number of vertices uh, matrix with all of our node information. And the notation we're gonna use is that for a node V, a uh, big N of V is the neighbors of V, okay? So this is the inputs that we're gonna use in, into building this. And um, I don't think I need to go into this, but you know, there's, there's lots of, of features that, that uh, you have in typical applications. So for example, I'll just read the first one. So if you, if you are looking at a social network, then obviously you're gonna have various information about users, whatever it is that you want, you can have things about their activity, you can have demographics, you can have whatever. So, so it's, it's very common. In some cases, if you really don't have any information on the nodes, you can use a placeholder. So you can use the degree, um, you can use a very simple uh, indicator vector, <laughs> which is hot encoding, where ev every single uh, um, node just gets a unique, or they don't even have to be unique. You can actually just give them ones um, and, and things will work. All right, so if we take this, all this information, what happens if we just throw it into our standard MLP? Well, it's not gonna work. There's, there's, there's two main problems with this, okay? So this is our adjacency matrix A. If we just add new columns with, with our, our uh, node features, uh, this, this, this works. This gives us a nice, a nice um, um, matrix. Um, it's going to have as many rows as there are nodes, and it's going to have uh, the number of nodes plus the number of features M uh, columns. Uh, one problem with this is that if this is, is what you feed into a, a dense neural network, the number of parameters on here is going to be gigantic. It's going to be right M plus uh, the number of nodes inputs to that first layer. It's also gonna be kind of weird because if you have a graph of size five and you build an MLP for it, what do you do if you then have a graph of size seven? They're different sizes. The MLP doesn't really fit. And of course the biggest problem we have, and this is, this is the, the question that, that Ravi teed up, is, well, we, can, we said this was A, B, C, D, E and there's a particular ordering. If we change the ordering of the rows and columns, the adjacency matrix means the same thing but this MLP will output different results. That was, I was, that's what I was talking about. Um, they may be similar if you're lucky, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna guarantee that it's gonna output identical results. Um, so what if we steal an idea from CNNs, okay? So this, this uh, top part here shows basically, um, you know, a three by three kernel and this filter is first centered on node one. And so then the green box shows that these are the, the, the nine pixels that it's taking its input. And then, you know, when it's centered on node two, then these are the nine, the node three, the node four. So it's pulling from different pixels. Well, we're all familiar with this. Uh, but what we wanna do is we wanna say, okay, this is a nice simple lattice. It's a grid, you know, well-defined, how can we extend this idea uh, when we don't have that regular structure? So our structure is all funky. You, 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 um, 
you know, any particular node has, has different numbers of neighbors. And then how do you define sliding a window, sliding a filter across a graph? There's no real, you know, easy way to define that. So in this section, we're really just sort of saying like, what are the problems we need to solve? We haven't really solved it yet. Um, and so there's a couple terms here that we're gonna talk about. Um, so uh, I don't think we need to, I, I think people understand this. I don't think we need to go into too much detail, but you know, permutation and variance. So this shows the same graph here, left and uh, top and bottom. And you'll notice that the, the um, colors on all the nodes are the same, but we just changed the labels. So in this one, this brown node is A, but on the bottom one, the, 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 the brown node is called E, and it shows the two adjacency matrix, which matrices, which are equivalent. We know conceptually they represent the exact same graph, but clearly the actual uh, values in the adjacency matrix are different. So um, really, we're just saying that the, these are different permutations of each other, and uh, people know that you know there's basically n factorial permutations. So what we want is we want to define this thing in a way where the graph representation is the same regardless of the ordering, regardless of the permutation of our labels. This is, this is again, this is the question that Robbie asked. So um, we're going to say formally that permutation, you know, invariance means that no matter how you reorder the nodes, you get the exact same answer. All right, we're also going to introduce another concept. Um, permutation equivariance, okay? So some of you may be already familiar with these nodes, I apologize, these terms, I apologize. But permutation equivariance means that we're not gonna get the same answer, but basically that we're going to, for the brown node, whether it's at the top or whether it's down here, we're gonna get the same uh, answer for the brown node, okay? But the whole thing still might look different. So in other words, um, more formally, if you permute the nodes, then the answers are permuted in the exact same way. Okay, so permutation of F. Um, so for permutation invariance, permutation of F gives you the exact same answer. For permutation equivariance, permutation of F gives you permutation of the answer. So um, those are some of the terms that, that uh, we're gonna look at. And if you have these ideas of permutation equivariance, and permutation invariance, then what you can think of a, of a graph neural network as is we're gonna do a bunch of permutation equivariant operations, which means that no matter which way we number, however we label the nodes, um, we're going to get corresponding information for the corresponding nodes. We can still have them listed in whatever order we want, but whatever's associated with node A will be associated with that node, regardless of whether it's the first, the last, the middle node, whatever. If we go all the way to doing something like a whole graph level prediction, so let's say we're doing a molecule prediction, then we're just getting one answer out for the entire graph. In that case, you need a permutation invariant operation at the very end. You need something that then will give you the exact same answer regardless. So that's what people have looked at. So, so computer scientists, mathematicians have looked at what are the things that you can do um, on, on a collection of nodes that is either permutation equivariant or permutation invariant. Um, and once again, we talked about, hey, what if you did it with an MLP? So the answer is no. Permutation, uh, MLPs are neither permutation invariant or equivariant. So the weights are very much tied to input number one input number two, input number three, and so forth. Um, so ultimately what we can think about is if you treat the um, neighbors as people who are passing you messages and you treat those messages as a set, then if we do set operations that are order independent, um, then what we will have is we will have um, at least a, a permutation equivariant operation. And so that's how we're gonna build our graph neural networks is we're gonna use our neighbors. Um, so we're not trying to solve this problem all at once. We're not trying to solve the whole graph. We're only gonna deal with our neighbors. But what we'll see is that if you repeat um, 
then then basically um, as you repeat this process, you get a, a larger uh, focal width and, and you can actually get information from not just your neighbors, but then from your neighbors of your neighbors and so on. All right, so I know I haven't actually given you anything concrete yet, like this is what we are gonna do, but I've given you a little bit of stuff around this is what we're not gonna do and some stuff around like why, you know, CNNs and MLPs and all that, you know, doesn't work and a little bit of terminology. So any questions so far before uh, I finally stop teasing you and actually just tell you what we are gonna do? Uh, Tad? Yes. Yeah, just a quick uh, question. Like, do you think there's a, a similarity, say, between graph neural network with the convolutional? Because I feel convolutional is also like taking taking into account the neighbor's information. Yes. Yes. There's there's a very strong similarity, and and we'll show. Uh, I'm going to show it in a couple places. Um, but but we're 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 building up to that. It's a great question. Anything else? All right, so I'm gonna stop teasing you. So we talked about some of this um, um, deep learning challenges and, and what we need, um, building blocks. And so now we're actually gonna say, what is a basic graph neural network? Let's talk about graph convolutional networks. All right, so, um, this node I that's kind of the dark red here in the center, um, it has one, two, three, four, five neighbors that you can see inside this first uh, oval, okay? And so we're gonna say that uh, in step one, uh, you see here it says K equals one. In step one, we are going to build a computation uh, using just the information from I's neighbors. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate. And so you can imagine that if we extend the computation, then for K equals two, we have all the neighbors of the neighbors. Um, and so now we're gonna get information from all of the nodes that are up to two hops away from I. And so you can see fairly quickly that if we did this for three, four, five, six layers, you're gonna have a lot, a lot of potential structural information uh, from I that can all be sort of pouring into I as sort of the information command center. Right now, we're not yet saying what exactly is that information. We're just saying that this is a computation graph where information is going to be staged um, uh, within each neighborhood and it's gonna kind of you know, pool up um, in this one location. So, um, so Yan, you were asking about like, like CNNs. So um, I specifically wanted to share. So for people who are familiar with CNNs, the neighborhood of each node in a graph convolutional network is like a custom filter for each node. So in a CNN, if you have say a three by three filter, because the grid is a regular structure, you can know that a three by three will work more or less for all of the nodes. Now we do have this thing where we say, well, what happens when you get to the very edge? So if you're on the corner or an edge, then, uh, you know, for those who are familiar, right? If you, if you have padding off, then you basically say the three by three is not defined and you can't calculate it. Um, if you do zero padding, then you actually can, but technically speaking, you're doing something slightly different because you, you're getting inputs from not really nine nodes because some of them are, are, are you know, zeros. Um, but so in a graph, you could have degree one, you could have degree a thousand. And so it's like, we are using filters just like in CNNs, but in this case, the filter is customized to each node based on its neighborhood. And then we have this question of, well, how do you slide the filter over everything? And the idea is that basically, we're not gonna slide it per se, we just need to calculate it for every node, okay? Um, and I'm also gonna just add that in a CNN, like the way I was taught, the way I always think of it is that this window slides, you know, I think of it as, you know, sliding across the columns, and then you go to the next row and it slides across all the columns. But the reality is that sliding is conceptual. You can calculate 
the filter on all the different locations in the CNN in parallel simultaneously. You don't need to technically slot. It. And the same thing is true for GNN. You do have a custom filter based on the neighborhood, but you can calculate the, um, the neighborhood for each node in parallel. You don't need any information from anybody else. And so if you, if you don't think about this, the, the CNN as physically sliding as much as just calculating it for every position, then the analogy between uh, graph convolutional networks and CNNs, I think is, is a little bit stronger. Um, I'm not that strong with my math to know exactly what math convolutions are. And so I'm just gonna say that if you are someone who knows that, I don't know that this word convolution in graph convolutional network is really a mathematical convolution. What they really mean is that this is very similar to CNNs. Okay, so, um, so, so just know that, that basically we're saying this is the very basic graph neural network and this GNN is very similar to CNNs. Okay, so let's take a look at this graph here and let's just talk about one target node, okay? We're not, gonna, we're not gonna worry about computing the whole thing. Let's just worry about this node A, which is, I don't know what that color is. Is it yellow? Is it light brown? Is it whatever? Node A here has three neighbors, B, C, and D. And so A is going to do, we haven't said what, is gonna do some kind of computation using information from B, C, and D. But B, C, and D have their own local neighborhoods. So B has two neighbors, A and C, C has four neighbors, and uh, D has only one neighbor, and in fact, it's A. So A is going to be getting indirectly information from itself through D, okay? So this is the idea of creating a computation graph, and then we can do this same computation graph for every single node. We're only showing node A here on this slide. So what are we gonna do? What are we gonna build in here? Well, we're gonna do what we know how to do. We're gonna put a neural network in here. We're gonna put a small little MLP. Um, and so basically this is, this is gonna be, you know, uh, a little matrix multiplication and a, uh, and a nonlinearity, right? Uh, so that, so that's, that's basically gonna be the answer that we'll see. Might not see it on the next slide, it might take a little while, but that's, that's basically the answer. So one thing that you can see, and this is, this is a point that um, um, is made in the, in the Stanford lectures, is that now uh, we've written out really small, but we've written out what the computation graph looks like for all six of these nodes, okay? And if you use the colors, since you can't really read things, you, you, you can play along and you can see, in fact, that yeah, in fact, based on the neighborhoods, neighbors, if we go two levels, these are what the computation graphs. And you can see that computation is different for each of the nodes because they have different degrees, because they have different neighbors. It's kind of interesting though, that if you have two nodes like E and F, this purple and pink, that have similar neighbors, then they have very similar computation graphs. In a CNN, it's not really possible for two pixels to have almost identical neighborhoods. But it is possible in, in, um, in, in a graph. So you could have a social network, you have two people that have 20 friends and it's the exact same 20 friends in common except for they're friends with each other. Hypothetically, they, they could both not even be friends with each other. They could have exact identical friends. And so uh, in the case where you had two nodes that had 20 identical friends, they're gonna have the exact same computation graph. Now, what's different though, from when we were doing node to vec is now each of the no these nodes has their own node features. So they're not guaranteed to get the same results. In node to vec you get the same results because they have these identical neighborhoods. Well, they don't, because their two hop neighborhood will include each other, okay? But, they're, but even, with, even, even at the one hop neighborhood level, you're not gonna get the same thing because now you're incorporating not just information from their neighbors, but you're including information um, from your own uh, embeddings. So 
here's where I want to pause a moment and I want to again uh, uh, bring up the analogy to CNNs. So this is something that I, I, I thought uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't as clear as possible in the, in the, in the Stanford lectures. So um, here's a picture and I apologize, I was working late last night to put these slides together. So um, hat tip um, to um, Aurelian Geron because I, I took this picture from hands-on machine learning. Okay, so this is his CNN chapter, I took this picture. Um, I added some colors to it. So here you can see a three by three filter um, being run on you know, this bottom can, layer. Um, and, uh, and it's generating um, um, the, the next layer up top here, okay? And so I can say, well, what is the first level computation for this red pixel? This is one in the corner. I purposely picked the corner because it's less work because uh, uh, it actually only has four pixels that contribute to it. The, the sky blue, the pink, the yellow, and the green. Okay, and so you can see over here on the right, I'm showing there's these four pixels that are contributing to the computation for this red node. And for the blue, it's got a different computation graph. It's actually got six different inputs. And we can extend this. Um, what if we say not first level, but second level? So if I imagine a, a node up here, okay, uh, because it's on the corner, it's also only going to have four inputs, this red, this, I don't know, periwinkle, the, the blue, and this, whatever that is, beige. And you'll notice that the computation graphs for each of these is a different shape. This one's two by two, this one's two by three, three by two, three by three, okay? So I think everybody here, if you're familiar with CNNs, you understand that here we're using zero padding, but every one of these pixels, every one of these four pixels is getting the exact same three by three filter, yet they're technically getting a custom computation graph because you know, we're sliding it, we're, 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 we're moving it over different um, locations. So, so if we go back to this slide where it says, hey, every node, gets a custom computation graph. I don't want you to overly think that like, oh my God, that means that we're just building this special custom thing for, for each node. No, we're not. We're doing the exact same thing. It's just that the neighborhood defines what all the inputs are. And it's the same thing in the CNN. It's the neighborhood of each pixel that defines what are the inputs. But the operation itself is really just kind of a, a fixed operation. Um, where you say, I will operate on my neighborhood. It's just neighborhood is customized for each node. Does that make sense? The, the, the analogy in terms of that CNNs, technically they have custom computation graphs too. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. The neighborhood for a graph, we can see it on the matrix by rows and columns. So the neighborhood is a whole, uh, actually, well, rows and columns are more or less equivalent because we have symmetry across main diagonal. So let's pick up a column and the neighborhood of the node is pretty much all other nodes where we have one. So they all are picked up as a neighborhood. Yes, yes. So if we have a simple undirected graph, the column, uh, has ones and zeros, and the ones are all of your neighbors. And it could be one node, it could be a thousand, I guess technically it could be zero, but, um, uh, and so we're going to use all of those as inputs. So whereas for an image, you know that you have eight neighbors plus yourself, you have nine, if you have, if you consider yourself, you know, one of your inputs, um, and then you have edges and corners, you know, but you kind of know it's always nine, for a graph, it can be any number for each node, but other than the fact that the number of inputs is different, you can think of this as being just like a CNN where you're gonna apply the same rules to every node using its neighbors. Okay, so our filter has no fixed uh, size. It doesn't have a fixed size, but I will specify in a moment what the fixed operation is. Okay. Yes, but, but I just wanted 
since I think most people here are probably at this point fairly comfortable with CNNs, I wanted to just strengthen this analogy so that you don't think that graph neural networks are somehow this very complex thing. When we talk about custom computation graphs, it doesn't necessarily mean anything that complicated just because CNNs technically have a custom computation graph. Um, but we know it's just this one filter applied everywhere, the same exact filter. Okay, so then the other thing is we've been talking about computation graphs from sort of the, um, the node perspective of if I'm a particular node, um, here's all the information that comes to me, okay? And if you've ever seen people talk about like sort of the focal width of, um, you know, a particular pixel and a particular layer, um, then you might have seen an idea sort of like this where you say, well, if it's three by three filter, it can see, you know, up to nine pixels, you know, from the previous layer. But if you go two previous layers, uh, then maybe it's five by five. Three previous layers, maybe it's, you know, seven by seven. And then I'm not going to get into like pooling layers, doubling focal width and all that stuff. Um, but normally when you talk about things, if you say, what's the architecture of of uh, ResNet 18 or something like that. You don't normally talk about that. You just talk about these layers, right? So um, in the same way, you can think of graph neural networks as having layers. So we've been talking about like, oh, a computation graph. So like, let's say this node A here is gonna gather information from its three neighbors, B, C, and D. And those in turn will have gotten information from their neighbors, okay? But the reality is that if you compute all this stuff one layer at a time, it, it looks a lot like a CNN in terms of that you have these layers. So what do the layers look like? So every layer of a GNN is going to have the exact same number of nodes as the, as the original graph, okay? And so this is just like a CNN where with you CNN with padding, it has the exact same dimensions. Okay, now again, I'm ignoring we explicitly purposefully use pooling in CNNs because we want them to be a smaller size. But if you just had a couple convolutional layers in a row uh, with padding, um, you would have the exact same height and width in that CNN, all right? And so that's what happens in a graph neural network, except it always happens. You, every, every layer in a, graph, in a graph neural network always has the exact same number of nodes, which is equal to the number of vertices in your original graph, okay? It's also true that um, oftentimes the embedding size is constant in all of the layers, but it does not have to be. There are certain approaches where the embedding size for each layer can grow, or, or the second might be different from the first, and then it, the, the rest of them might be the same or whatever. Um, but so if you think about this, in a CNN, we don't always assume that, that the depth, the number of channels is the same for every layer, okay? Um, so just like you can have a different number of channels in a CNN, you can have a different number of channels, you can have a different embedding depth um, for your graph neural network. So just wanted to pause there because sometimes I find it easier in my mental map to think of a graph neural network this way as just multiple, call it copies of the graph, so the first one starts with your original node data, your node embeddings, and then the next one does a computation on, on neighbors and it calculates a new set of embeddings, and then you repeat however many times you want to. So in terms of like building a GNN, in terms of thinking you know, more macroscopically, I prefer to think of it this way as layers. When we're talking about like how you compute it and what is like the theoretical computational power of a graph neural network, then it might be easier to think of it in terms of this computation graph, okay? Because then you could say, oh, well, clearly these are all of the nodes. This is the focal width of this black node, okay? These are all the things that can possibly input into a particular item. So, um, so neither is right, neither is wrong. They are both true simultaneously. And so I just wanted to kind of share that um, um, for me, like this, pic this mental picture really helps me 
you know, thinking of it as layers that have exactly, you know, as exactly sort of the same nodes, but just different embeddings at each layer. All right. Um, so then continuing on, you can decide how many layers you want to have. All right. So or again, we start layer zero is the original embeddings, the node features. Um, and then layer K um, gets information from all the nodes that are up to K hops away, which technically includes itself. So here we see layer zero, layer one, layer two. And so we're, again, we're using X's because we said X is our original set of node embeddings. All right, so we've got this computation analogy. Would you please just say, what the heck is this black? What is this box supposed to represent? How are we gonna aggregate it? So we've talked about this whole business of, hey, it needs to be a set operation, needs to be a permutation, equivariant. What are we gonna do? So a super simple thing you could do is you could just average all of the inputs from your neighbors. Okay, you could sum them like you do in the CNN, but then of course you can imagine something with degree one and something with degree thousand will get very different, uh, uh, potentially very different scale answers. So averaging is, is intuitively probably a little bit safer because then they'll at least be on the same scale regardless of your degree. So super, super simple thing you could do is you could say, I'm just gonna take all of the embeddings from my neighbors B, C, and D, I'm going to add them up and I'm going to divide by three. Um, if you do just that, you're not going to get anything very interesting. So instead, what you're going to do um, is you're going to uh, you're going to take the B, C, and D embeddings. Uh, you're going to apply a, a small neural network. You're going to apply a single layer MLP to it. So let's look at this sort of from the formula of using a single MLP. So we're gonna multiply by a single weight matrix. So in the zeroth layer, we start with our original um, embeddings. So our node embeddings are, are uh, X. So the output, so to speak, embedding um, uh, H, we're gonna call it. The output embedding at layer zero for node V is just the original node features. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, the output from the previous layer. Uh, we're gonna sum them up and then we're gonna, we're gonna divide by the number of nodes. So this is, this is where we said we're um, averaging them and we're gonna apply a weight matrix here. We're also going to, um, in, our, in our graph convolutional network, um, we are going to take our own embedding from the previous layer. And we're also going to apply a matrix there, uh, B, uh, to that. Um, and once again, there's a note here that summation is permutation invariant. Okay. So it doesn't matter what order you are, what, what order you put the nodes, you'll always get the same sum. So if we take this, this combination, okay, of something from my previous layer and something from all my, my neighbors, previous layer, um, we apply this, this uh, uh, um, uh, linear transformation. Now, what, what's the next thing that we do in, in an MLP? We apply nonlinearity. So this could be ReLU, could be whatever, okay? And so then this is our next layer, K plus one embedding, is a nonlinearity applied to this. So we're gonna do this for all the layers, zero through K minus one, all right? And then our final output typically is just the output from the last layer, all right? Our H from the K, from the Kth final layer. Any questions on, on this slide, the, the, the math? This, this is the same thing we're saying before, except we're just simply saying, we're gonna apply a, um, an MLP to the average of the inputs from our neighbors and our bias term here uh, is using our own embedding from the previous layer. Okay. So now we can see that, um, that this 
scheme of using message passing is equivariant, okay? Um, it does not matter the order in which you list your neighbors. They're going to come in, they're going to get some, they're going to get applied by matrix, and um, um, you'll get the, and then the nonlinearity. You're going to get the same answer regardless of what order. Um, okay, so then finally, how do we train this neural network? So let's just say that um, we've got this neural network here, and it's defining, uh, it's going to output this final answer. Um, Z for node A, and respectively, all the other Zs for the other nodes. Well, basically, how do we ever train a neural network, <laughs> right? We define a target, we define a loss function, and we use back, we use gradient descent. So, uh, so in this case, what we used to think of our trainable parameters, our thetas, right, are these two weight matrices. Um, and we're going to use, you know, SGD, one of its variants, um, with whatever loss function we want. All right. Um, so what are our loss functions going to be? Uh, sorry. Uh, loss functions comes a little bit later. Um, just one little side note. Um, by the way, I, uh, <laughs> I see there's a lot of messages in the chat, but it doesn't look like they're questions to me. So I'm, I'm not pausing for any of that. Um, uh, okay, so one thing I did want to mention, though, because I do see a little bit of some conversation about matrix multiplication, whatever, is in this very simple thing that we've defined, where we're just applying uh, a weight matrix W multiplied by, you know, your neighbors, you can do this calculation instead of one node at a time. You can actually do this, this calculation in parallel in one giant fell swoop. And how do you do that? Basically, you use the adjacency matrix, which, which Maya was kind enough to, to mention earlier. So if you have the adjacency matrix, it lists all the neighbors. And so you can take this matrix W and you can, you can apply this using the adjacency matrix. So I'm not going to kind of go through all of um, the math here, but basically we do have a scaling factor so if you're familiar with the idea of, of D being a diagonal matrix with the degree of every node, then um, D inverse or, or however you are, think of it, you know, is basically uh, one over the degree for every node. And that lets you do this bottom part, this denominator where you scale it. And so basically you can do this scaling, uh, D inverse, and you can then basically just take this, this one weight matrix um, and uh, you can then uh, multiply, sorry, we haven't gotten to weight matrix yet, but you take this and you multiply it by the adjacency matrix, and this will do the, the, the summation and averaging uh, for all the nodes. And on the second slide here, we can then say, oh, we want to um, uh, do this operation. And so basically then we're gonna uh, multiply by our weight matrix W here. And then we can do B separately. And I can't remember if there's a slide or not, but if you just change the adjacency matrix to create a self loop to yourself, then you don't even need this extra part here. You can just do it all as this big weight matrix. So uh, the, these, these lectures are not really going to talk about how do we, how does somebody implement this graph neural network efficiently, okay? This is basically the only slide where we talk about it, okay? So this is really just talking right now about the theory the power, how you do it, why it works. Um, and if you want to know how does somebody actually program GraphSage, that's, you'll have to look somewhere else, okay? All right, so getting back then to the actual training of it. Um, so we've got our final output from the final layer, we, our Z for, for each node, and basically we're going to define a loss function. So if what you're doing is you're predicting a real number, so you're predicting like say a solubility number or something like that, uh, then you can just use L2 loss. Um, if you're doing something like, is it toxic? Is this molecule toxic or not? Uh, you use binary cross entropy. And in a couple, the next couple slides, what we'll show is that you can do this training either in a supervised or in an unsupervised fashion. So let's talk about, um, unsupervised first. Basically, we don't have targets, 
So all the stuff that we talked about in, in Ryan's session about uh, graph structure, uh, we can use those same tricks here. Okay, so we can use random walks, we can use, you know, whatever. So we're going to want to have similar nodes defined the exact same way that we did uh, when we were talking about node to vec and these other things. Okay, so similarity can be co-occurrences on random walks, just like in node to vec. Then what, what we're going to do is we're going to have that definition of similarity, um, which will then give us basically um, this sort of, you know, pairwise similarity. Um, and then we can apply uh, binary cross entropy um, based on if, uh, based on uh, whatever the values of, of that similarity measure, you know, says for, for those particular pairs of nodes. And so it says here, right? So the stuff we talked about, random walks, no proximity, whatever. So you can, so if you don't have an actual supervised setting, you can use this to, to create general graph embeddings for your graph. The other thing you can do is you can do supervise. So in this case, let's say uh, you've got a network of different drugs and whatever, you know, the body systems they interact with and whatnot. And you've got certain drugs that you know are toxic and certain drugs you know are not toxic. So those are your training set. Those are your labeled nodes. Um, and you can run this, this GNN on just the training nodes. All right. And then you backprop your loss um, from, from just the training nodes. And then after you're done doing that, then of course you can make predictions on all of your unlabeled nodes. And so then this just shows once again, uh, binary cross entropy. So you have, you know, one minus your, your label um, times the log of one minus the prediction, and then as well as the label times the prediction here. Okay, so to recap, what we've done is we've said that by just looking at our immediate neighborhood, we can define a computation graph. But if we repeat this with multiple layers, ultimately we're building a bigger and bigger graph, which allows a larger focal width, which allows a node to receive computation, not just from its immediate one hop neighborhood, but we can define K, how many layers we wanna have, and then we will have some level of information from our k hop neighborhood. Obviously, more information from our closer neighborhood. Um, uh, and in that way, we can take our node features, we can take the structure of the graph around us, and we can take the features of the nodes in the structure around us. We can combine all three of those things and if you say, well, how exactly do you combine it? I mean, that's that's what training is about, right? Deep neural networks, for the most part, I don't know exactly how a CNN learns exactly what the filters should be, but it's doing it because it's getting a signal through backpropagation. It's getting a signal as to whether or not it's it's getting closer or farther from the from the 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 labels, right? So it's the same thing here. Um, how exactly does the graph neural network know um, how much to combine structure versus how much to weight this? I, I don't know, um, but it's the same thing. It's just asking me, you know, what, how did the, the, the CNN in layer three learn, you know, that those particular values for a filter? It's, it's back propagation. It's, it's not something that necessarily is human interpretable. Okay, so once we've done that, we train, and now here's an interesting thing. Now that we've sort of set this up and we said we're gonna train this, take note that, um, okay, sorry. Let's say we only, I, I mentioned this verbally, so here's a picture. If we only had these three as labeled nodes, we could train it with these, and then we can actually make predictions on the remaining nodes, the blue, the purple, uh, the pink. So that's really nice, okay? We're using the exact same GNN with the exact same weights. At this point, you know, once we're done training, the weights are frozen. We can apply this um, to other nodes. Okay. In fact, not only can we apply to to other nodes. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm a slide ahead. Um, but just to be clear, when you see these boxes in here, um, that are the weights, right? 
these are the same weights whether you're running it on the yellow node or whether you're running on the red node. It's just like a CNN. You know, once you have the filters, you apply that filter to all pixels. You you don't you don't change it. So these are shared parameters. And in particular, if you figure out the number of parameters, the number of parameters is not that high. Okay. So whereas with node to vec, um, or, or that initial idea of what if we just built an MLP, it would have this massive, massive number of parameters. Um, here, this is just fixed, you know, and it's per layer or whatever. But so as the number of nodes grows, the number of parameters does not. So it's actually sublinear in the number of nodes. Um, in addition to uh, being able to apply this to unseen nodes, if we were doing a graph level prediction, like is this entire graph, is this molecule toxic or not? You can run this MLP with its weights once it's trained on a completely different graph, All right? So this is not like node to This is far more generalizable. Um, I can take uh, an entirely new. And so hypothetically, I could take a GNN, train it on Facebook uh, a social network, and I could run it on a LinkedIn social network, which is completely, utterly different. And, and it, would, it would have useful properties, okay? I'm not gonna get into the details, like fine tuning, you know, whatever. But, uh, but it's not like you have to completely necessarily retrain it from scratch, just because you're, you're transporting it to a, a, a new scenario. <clears throat> and then here's one of the big ones, is that uh, somebody asked a few weeks ago, well, what happens when your graph changes? So uh, our GNN, once we've trained it with uh, uh, something like a social network, as a new node arrives, we've got those weights um, already trained and we can then run the computation from the perspective of this new purple node. And we do not uh, need to retrain the model. We can then get accurate predictions uh, for, for new, new nodes. So for example, social network. This is going to happen. The social network is constantly evolving, and so if you have um, new nodes, uh, then then you can get predictions from this. You're not retraining the model, so you can see why this is much more flexible and much more powerful um, than all the stuff that we've talked about before, the handcrafted features or um, like node to vec. All right, I know this was a long segment, but basically this is. The simplest form of graph neural network, graph convolutional networks, where all we're doing is averaging the inputs from our different um, uh, from our different neighbors, and applying a simple one-layer dense feedforward neural network, a simple one-layer MLP to it, and so it's most likely it's just a matrix multiply and then ReLU let's just say, as a, as a non-linearity. So let me pause here and see if there's any questions, any, any, uh, any comments, anything that people can help clarify, anything from the chat um, before we kind of move on to the, the last uh, few things for today. Uh, so for the previous slides you mentioned, when there are new rows, uh, new node come in, uh, we don't need to retrain the model. Can you explain why? Because the graph structure changed, right? So this picture on this slide is a fairly small graph, right? It's like, what is it, eight nodes or something like that, right? So imagine that you, you trained it on your social network and you have tens of thousands of users, okay? Uh, and you have specific node embeddings. So you have demographics, you have other features about these, these each user. So the graph neural network has learned how to combine the, the properties of the user's features and the user's neighborhood's features, okay? So that's been learned and that's embedded in the weights of your, of your, your matrices at each layer. So once you've trained it, how much to use structure, how much to use, which demographics to use, what structure to use, that then generalizes. You, 
you can then have new people coming into your uh, social network and you can just apply that same computation with the same weights on those new nodes. Now, if you have some, you know, that, that doesn't change the fact that for any machine learning problem, you can, you can, you can basically have drift, okay? So if, if you say, you know, Facebook when it was just Harvard students, maybe things were fundamentally different than Facebook today. So no, I'm not saying uh, something that you trained years and years ago would never need to be retrained, but that's because of concept drift, right? Um, but if you, if you just say, you know, Facebook has God knows how many millions of users, you probably don't even need to train the graph neural network on all of them. You could just train it on 100,000 of them and it would learn the appropriate way to use those inputs. And then you can, you can do predictions on all the other nodes, whether they existed already or whether they're new users. Okay, makes sense. So another question is, um, uh, back, back to last lecture, that example about user item uh, interaction, that's mm -hmm. more for product recommendation. Uh, that this GNN works for that case, because for that case, the node have two type. One is user and user feature, another is um, item, item feature. So the layer will become, if you start with user, the next layer will be item, item next layer will be user. Uh, it's just wondering for that case, uh, how does this GNN work? I'm learning this along with you. So I don't know that I, I have a great answer. I'll, in a moment, I'll just see if anybody else here knows. I will say you absolutely can run GNN on a bipartite graph, okay? And in fact, one of the key features for a node can be, is it a user or is it an item, okay? And, and so the, the GNN will very much, you know, learn. Uh, but in particular, uh, uh, you can do link prediction with GNNs. I know I've seen that, but the, uh, uh, the recommendation thing is a slightly different formulation. And so I'm sure people have done it, but I don't, I don't know off the top of my head exactly how you would set that up. I don't know, does anybody else here? know how that's set up. All right, so I don't have the answer, but I believe like three, four sessions from now, there's like specifically a, a topic we're going to cover. So it's like topic 10 is like GNNs for recommender, recommenders, okay? So I'm yeah, sorry, awesome. I, don't know, I don't know the answer how, but, but there's gonna be a whole session devoted just to that. Okay, that's which chapter 10? Uh, where's, where's my window? So, so, so we're here. So one, two, three, four lectures from now. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have a question about the message passing from neighbors. Uh, for one layer neural, neural network, uh, the node will learn from their direct neighbors and two layer will learn to hop away. So if we set up the, the, the a neural network for two layer, but uh, we run two uh, epochs, so they still go two hops away at the first uh, uh, epoch and uh, then the next hop and next epoch, it will learn uh, th the third layer, the fourth layer. So uh, seems it doesn't matter. Like a beginning we set up is a very shallow uh, neural network or deep neural network. It will it's very easy to pick up the information far away from the the node we want to learn. Is that true? Wow, that's a really great question. I didn't, I, I didn't notice, I don't know that I've read it explicitly, but I think when they train these, they only run one epoch. That's kind of the vibe that I got from, from all this discussion. It was really, but, it, but there's no reason why you couldn't run more than one. Uh, so uh, I don't know if anybody, again, uh, happy if somebody else, but but just from the, 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 the tone, the, I didn't even realize that I was making this assumption. 
from the way everything's described, I think they only run one APOC. They don't, they don't iterate in that in the, in the way we do with, you know, image classifiers. All right, let me see if I can get concrete confirmation of that. Um, but yes, by, by running only one epoch, then it's, it's very clear. And actually, e let me, let me can just can clarify I, one other thing. E oh yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Can I ask a kind of different but related question? Can you yeah. go back to the section where you were showing the CNN next to the GNN representation? this yeah yeah so on the on the left side that bottom uh plane with all the pixels mm -hmm. you're you're doing that first convolution and then the the upper one you're doing another convolution on it right yeah yeah i'm saying if we have a three by three filter here which generates these pixels mm -hmm. and then we had another three by three filter generating the black pixel so Typically in a CNN, we have different um, different filters at each layer, right? So yes. is that is that the case on the GNN as well? Because it oh. when I look at the right side, yes. I see that there's there's this sort of two hop deeper one, and that's that is that the same MLP that's applied to the two hops and the one hop, or is it a different uh, one? You're right. I screwed up. So I meant to color this box a different, slightly different color. In some of the slides, it was a different color. That's that's yeah. why I was asking. Yeah, I yeah, wasn't sure if it's the was, same. That was Professor Leskovitz's slide, but I forgot. I made this slide <laughs> from scratch, and I forgot. No, this is supposed to be a different color to indicate that this layer has different weights mm -hmm. for the filter than this layer. And so these are all supposed to be identical uh, squares because they're using the exact same weights. Mm -hmm. But this one was supposed to be a different color and I forgot to do that. Well, right. well, the, the reason I was clarifying that though is I, I, I think the question that was just asked was kind of pointing at we're doing this iteratively and we're doing the first top layer and then we're doing the second top layer. And I don't know that that's the case. My interpretation was we're doing the full depth of the graph and we can do multiple epochs. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so like when you have an RNN, we, we think about it as like unrolling in time, okay? So to use that analogy, this, what I'm talking about, a simple GCN, graph convolutional network, is not an RNN unrolling in time. This is a physically separate layer from this layer, from this layer, which Ryan was getting at. The weights in here are different from the weights in here. And in fact, what I said is the embedding size doesn't even need to be the same. It could be you originally have a node that has 20 features. You have some, some, some age, gender, you know, what state they live in, blah, blah, blah. And then this thing could have 64 as it's embedding. And this thing could have 128 as it's embedding. So, um, so although they all have the same, I don't know what to call it, shape, you know, because it's the same number of nodes and the same conductivity at each layer, it, it kind of would be wrong to think of this as just one graph that you're then updating and then updating, and then updating in place. Okay. Um, um, because if you did that, then you would not be able to backprop across the, the different layers. You have, to, you have to store every layer and all of the calculations you did in, it, in order to then do the backprop back across all of them. So I think, Ryan, that, thank you. I think that helped. Um, did that answer the original question yeah. also yeah i think that clear up on my mind i think uh, yeah. there is still difference between how many layers and versus how many epochs because yeah. you have more layer you have more weight parameter yeah. set uh, there instead of yeah. using one layer you keep using the same right. weight yeah. right yeah this, this is this is not an RNN. and then i'm actually going to correct what i said before you have to run multiple epochs it's 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 sgd it's 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 slow so 
So what I said earlier, strike that. Uh, so they're definitely going to run multiple epochs, but but these are separate weights at each layer. And then just just for official clarity, <laughs> um, the, we're talking about a very simple GCN, okay? There are people who have experimented with exactly treating this like an RNN <laughs> and using shared weights across layers, okay? So... So, uh, so technically speaking, you can find a paper where someone did try doing that, but that's not, that's not true of all GNNs, okay? That's just somebody happened to try that. Um, okay. I'm sorry, I missed a number of lectures and maybe it was covered. My question is, so in the first layer we consider neighbors just you know which are one age removed of one node then next uh, with next layer of our network we combine this knowledge for neighbors of neighbors R so, like we do with uh, convolution usual convolution image so convolution like, this picture is probably a good one to answer that question so so in this one, I don't know what to call this, the second, the middle, you know, layer, it is for, for calculating the new embedding for A is only using the embed, the, the neighbors of A. So D, B, and C from the previous layer. Okay. Yes. When I calculate the embedding for A over here, I'm still only using D, B, and C. I'm using D, B, and C from this layer. It just so happens that this embedding for D, well, that's a bad example. This embedding for C is based on B, C, E, and F from this layer. But I'm only directly using my immediate neighborhood from the immediate prior neighborhood. This is more the concept of the focal width that as you, as you go back further, you can see that this immediate C that you're pulling from got contributions from B, E, and F, but I'm only going to directly use my immediate neighborhood at every layer. Does that answer the question, Maya? Um, not much, sorry for this. Uh, so C has, uh, it's embedding recalculated. And then we recalculate based on these embeddings for A. So think of this as C sub zero. This is your original node features. C sub one is based on B sub zero, E sub zero, and F sub zero, as well as itself. Okay. So the neighbors C of C two. comes with C input. Okay, so C in the next layer, C comes with input from its neighbors. It's immediate neighbors. So C oh, sub okay. two is based only on B sub one, E sub one, F sub one, and itself. Okay. C sub one, okay. It's only always just using its immediate neighbors, but we know B sub one inherently is, is, is a wider set of sub zero embeddings. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Okay. And then in the next lecture, it actually gets into uh, um, there, there's a there's a there's a couple slides that, that that even we'll talk about. Imagine that the diameter of your uh, graph uh, was was 12. So in 12 hops, you could get from any node to any other node. Okay, if you built a 12 deep GNN, every node is getting contribution from every other node. And that GNN might actually perform poorly because what you might find is that the final embeddings out of the 12th layer are very similar between all the nodes. So uh, whereas we've learned to build deeper and deeper networks, and so now we have these giant state-of-the-art models, CNNs that are super deep, and in language, even deeper, right? It's, not, it's gonna turn out to be not true that you want your GNN just to be as deep as, as you have computation to afford. No, you actually are gonna to wanna to stop. You don't wanna go forever deep because then you're actually getting too broad of a neighborhood and, and all the nodes become more similar. 
So for the social network, there are the six degree of separation uh, because you, you can use your friends or friends, know anyone in the in the world. So uh, the layers, uh, it that suggest to be less than six? Yes, turns out there's some regularization you can do. And so maybe you go to 10 something, but, oh, okay. but, but there's no such thing as ResNet 151. There's no GNN 151. Okay, so we're, we're just about out of time. There's a couple more slides. I just wanted to, um, th this is a very short section. Um, so at the very beginning, uh, there were, I think Yan was the one who said like, hey, isn't there a close relationship between GNNs and CNNs and whatever? And so in fact, how can we compare GNN to CNNs and transformers? So here's our, another uh, picture of a CNN and the, the, the mass for a filter. So this is three by three. Um, if you think of a CNN as a graph where these are the pixels, where everybody's connected to its north, south, east, west, and its diagonal neighbors and itself, then basically every node has nine, a degree of nine, okay? And so if you took an image and you just created it, turned it into a graph where every node, every pixel has degree nine, then in fact, you can just run our GCN and you will get the exact same thing as our current uh, oh, sorry, that's three by three filters. It'll give the exact same thing as a CNN with three by three filters. Um, and so then you can see here, the CNN can be seen as a special case, a subcase, um, where the grid just happens to have a very regular pattern with fixed neighbors, okay? And so, so we can do things where we can just assume because we have the positions of the, of the pixels. Uh, same thing then for transformers. In a transformer, uh, we're in self-attention, you compare every token to uh, all the other tokens. So we know it's quadratic. So if you have, if you have um, sequence length 1,000, then it, you're doing a million comparisons. Um, so what you can think of that basically is that uh, uh, if your sequence is a fully connected graph, then everybody is everybody's neighbor, okay? And in one hop, basically what you can do is you can do the comparisons to all of your. Now, the, the math in a, a transformer is a little bit different. It's, it's using, um, you know, query keys values, right? Um, we'll see, actually, people have actually uh, tried applying a similar kind of concept, but you can see that in terms of like, just the comparisons that you do, if we put the right operation in that box that we've been talking about, then in a fully connected graph, uh, you can turn a transformer uh, into, uh, you can get a GNN to calculate uh, the transformer uh, model as well. So in this way, we can say that GNNs are an abstraction of both CNNs and transformers. It's a generalization of this, but what we've done is we've now said we're not dependent upon that fixed topology. So grids have that, you know, north, south, east, west topology. Uh, sequences just have left, right topology. So now we say we've generalized. Um, and it's really fascinating to see that there's like this theory stuff. In, in two weeks, when, when Ryan does the next lecture, what you're going to see is Anything that you do that you've seen in a neural network, just in terms of like programming wise, you can chuck it into a GNN. Dropout, sure, throw a dropout layer in there. Batch norm, sure, throw it in there. Activation function, use any activation function you want. Learning rate scheduler, sure. <laughs> and so basically, the cool thing is we've done all of this abstraction, but in the end of the day, uh, as long as, as, as you've got somebody kind enough to, to give you a, um, a library <laughs> in which to program it, you, you can sort of forget about the fact that you're dealing with a graph and you can just say, I'm gonna do everything that I used to do. It's like, oh, I wanna try a, a batch norm and then a, 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 a JLU activation function and, and I'm gonna, 
put some drop out in here and I'm going to uh, ultimately you can do augmentation. <laughs> There's like, and so it's like, wow, these GNNs now basically look just like uh, regular neural networks, but we just needed this lecture to sort of justify why this architecture mathematically conceptually makes sense. Um, and then we just need to be careful again that if we're doing some summation average of our neighbors, we're doing something that uh, um, is, is, you know, permutation equivariant. And then also uh, this lecture doesn't really talk about it, but I mentioned that we did an average instead of a sum because uh, nodes can have very different degrees. And so there is in fact, even more advanced uh, scaling than just simply an average. So you can look at not just your degree, but you can actually look at the degree of your neighbors and use, and, and people have found that sometimes that helps with the scaling instead of just doing simple my degree scaling. All right, so to summarize, um, we've got multiple layers and each layer is only using uh, its immediate neighbors from the previous layer as its input. And if we keep aggregating this, we create more and more complex embeddings. You know, I think a lot about like BERT, right? BERT, you, you start with your initial embeddings and then um, after one transformer layer, you've got new embeddings. They're the exact same dimension in the case of BERT, but, but they're more complex. And then you do another layer and another and another layer and another. And after six layers of this, you actually have very interesting embeddings. And so a GCN with six layers will give you very interesting embeddings. Um, our GCN, is the very simplest of GNNs, and it just uses this mean aggregation. Um, I think some GCNs technically, like I said, are doing a little bit more complex. Um, and uh, that, that brief couple slides, this can actually be expressed in matrix form. And so the GCN conveniently, not only does it kind of work, but you can also calculate it super fast using a sparse matrix multiplication using the adjacency matrix. And then you can see that the GNN is a general architecture. Uh, you can think actually of CNNs and transformers as special cases. There are slides that uh, uh, the, the Stanford lecture had on just the basics of neural networks. So what's gradient descent, back propagation, stuff like that. Um, I threw them in at the in an appendix at the end of, of the slides here. Um, so if you want, they're, they're in there. When you download the slides, you'll see the, like the last 16 slides are those. Um, I also want to just mention that we talked about computation graphs and also how computation graphs and layers are not exclusive. They're just different ways of thinking about the same phenomenon um, and some very basics on how we train either in unsupervised or supervised way. There's, there's more coming in, in the next couple lectures. So we had motivation. We're aggregating from immediate neighbors. We're doing layers. Okay, that's what today was about. So we just said one very simple thing, which is let me take the embeddings from my neighbors and average them, okay? The next session that Ryan's gonna lead really gets into, we have many more choices for how we do aggregation and how we do message passing and updating. So even for example, ResNet, you know how we have skip connections? Well, people have tried skip connections in GNNs also, okay? So if you are familiar with the lots of different kinds of architectures, that there are in, in deep neural networks, you're going to see the exact same things people have tried them in GNNs. Um, and then uh, I haven't previewed it as much, but in, in two, so, so this is in two weeks. Um, Ryan's gonna talk about GraphSage, which is not a specific architecture, but it's kind of got like, you know, Here's where you, you, you take all the inputs from your neighbors and you choose from a menu of different operations that you're gonna perform. And here's you know, where you do an update, you can choose from a menu. And here's, you, know, you can choose what nonlinearity you want. You can choose you know, these things. So it's sort of a, a more general structure where you can, you can pick different options. Um, and, then, and then some other things in terms of uh, augmentation and what happens when you try to train it, you run into some issues. Uh, some details on that. That'll be in four weeks. That'll be two sessions from now. So that'll be Yan really rounding out so that we have both the theory and also 
if we're going to actually try this and try and get it to work on some some networks. 